at the back. I know last time I was preaching, there was some issue with the sound. That's loud enough. Yeah. More? A little. A little more. The Thank you, Alan. Air conditioning is noisy. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure I speak up. So, let us begin. Welcome to Bloom in the Desert Church in the United uh, Church of Christ. And we light the candle. Why do we light the candle? Christ the light of the world. Correct. Yeah, like Christ is the light of the world, so we use this as a symbol. But is this it? What happens after we leave here? We take it with us. We take it with us in our hearts. Exactly. Is anybody, uh, by the way, we're in the uh, seventh Sunday after Pentecost, which is very ordinary time. There's nothing particularly special about today. But, you know, every day is a day when we can focus out in the world, get caught up in the stuff of the world, the distractions, or we can come in sight. What? Louder. Louder? Okay. So this, this microphone doesn't work too well like that. I think I'm going to stay at the podium. <laughs> okay. So we're in ordinary time. Uh, this is an ordinary day. So let us pray. Father, Mother, God, we call ourselves forward once again into your holy life. Listening to your words and your voice and your calling that we will talk about today. And we ask for a special blessing on us, your people, gathered here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And always, Father, may thy will be done. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please rise as you are able and join me in reading the responsive call to worship. Come, give to the Lord your praises of thanksgiving. We come to say, pray for God's wondrous gifts to us. Sing with great enthusiasm of God's mighty power and love. We celebrate that love in our lives. It is a wonderful thing to praise God. May God's love fill us all this glorious day. Shalom, salam, inon, pause, peace, amen. This is the time in our worship when in faith we open our hearts to ministry with our prayer for good and growth. Now in prayer we welcome the spiritual embrace of God that comes with openness and reconciliation. Together we say, Lord of the dance of life, you have breathed into us your creative joyful spirit. You have lifted us from the dust into the soil of joy in your presence. We are so grateful for all that you have done for us. Each day reminds us in many ways of your mercy and your love. Yet there are times in our lives when we have felt lost and alone. We have been heard, frightened, and wondered where you are. Remind us again of your loving presence. Place your hands deep in our lives. Comfort us when we become afraid, lost, and lonely, and fearful. Prepare us to serve faithfully all our days. And as we have lifted the name of your ones to you, we need your healing love. Cause us to reflect on our needs for your love and our response and dedicated service to you. Be with us now in this time and place and all the places and times of our lives. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Loving Creator, wonderful Counselor, Sovereign of Peace, receive now our silent meditation and prayers. Amen. 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 Receive now these words of encouragement. God's love and grace are our reason and fuel for creating a new world beginning with loving ourselves and culminating in service to others. Amen. Amen. Let us now receive the word. 
Welcome, soldiers of Christ. <laughs> the Hebrew scripture reading for today is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The voice said, Mere mortal, stand up and I will speak with you. As it spoke, spirit entered me and raised me onto my feet, and I heard these words. Mere mortal, I am sending you to the Israelites for a rebellious nation that has revolted against me, and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. The people to whom I send you are defiant and stubborn. You are to say to them, thus says sovereign Yahweh. And whether they listen or they don't, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has come amongst them. And you, mere mortal, fear neither them nor their works. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading. The gospel reading today is from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. After leaving there, Jesus came into his own town, followed by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished and said, where did he learn all this? What is this wisdom that has been granted, and these miracles that are performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? They found these things to be stumbling, stumbling blocks. Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their own hometowns, and among their own relatives, and in their own households. And he could work no miracles there, apart from laying his hands upon a few sick people and healing them. Their lack of faith astounded him. He made the rounds of the neighboring villages instead and spent the time teaching. Here ends the reading of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. A prophet is without honor in his own hometown. Anybody have that experience? You know, you went to elementary school with someone, or high school, and it's like, you're so wise now. I remember how you were before then, you know, um, how you behaved. Um, oh, you were the teacher's pet, and, and here you are trying to tell us how to, how to live. Um, there's Jesus uh, suffering that. And we all experience some level of that. Yet he still goes and heals, but he heals in neighboring villages, not in his hometown. I know in my life I found myself way more accepted in other countries <laughs> than where I came from in Scotland. And just think about those brothers and sisters. Most people think of Jesus as being an only child. No, he had probably had three brothers, three sisters. Uh, Luke names four of them. And uh, can you imagine, you know, it's in those days the, the games kids played were simply with stones and rocks and sticks. But let's imagine that they would say, come on, Jesus, let's go. Actually, it wouldn't be Jesus. It would be Joshua, it would be Yeshua in the Hebrew. They'd be calling on Yeshua, let's go play soccer. No, no, I promised Dad I'd do this carpentry. And we want to go to Sephora's down the road where we're building this new city for Sephora's and we're part of the carpenter group. Prophet is without honor in their own country, especially when they're prophesying. There's Ezekiel. I have a special uh, relationship with Ezekiel. I'm going to tell you a story that very few people know in my own life. In 1986, I was at a meditation workshop in the north of England, in an old mansion house surrounded by sheep. There were sheep everywhere. Don't worry, I'm not going to do a sheep job. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm meditating. And those who have done a meditation class 
with me know how I go about that. You see, we have minds. As soon as we sit down to meditate, it's like, where did I leave my purse? What am I going to make for lunch? I wish he hadn't said that to me. I mean, the mind goes all over the place, right? So we have to quiet the mind. And how do we do that? By active meditation. I mean, we can just say the word one, and then the mind starts focusing on one. I mean, if I say Eiffel Tower, what, what are you seeing inside yourself? You've got Eiffel, um, get out of here, I'm trying to meditate. I'm trying to connect with God inside me. So the, the meditation I happen to use is from the ancient Sanskrit. Hugh, H-U, Hugh, man, child of God, as we all are. So I'm sitting here, you know, meditating, open body position, as I'm told to have. And suddenly this energy starts up from the base of my spine. It comes up through my body, and this was a real true story experience for me. You can say I'm hallucinating, that's fine. This is what I experienced. The energy came up through my body, up my spine, and I, I found it resting and pressing on the area people call the third eye. I was kind of scared, but I was hanging in there. This is important. And I exteriorized through there. I was up in the heavens. I was literally looking back at the world. I saw myself attached as if with a silver cord to the world. And I went through a number of experiences as I was there. It seemed to me like, you know, it could be half an hour. No, it was probably seconds I was out of the body. And then there was a pop, and I was back in the body. And in the darkness, I saw gold letters. It was a bit like Star Wars, you know, these letters come at you out of space. And I seen gold letters. And it appears to be Hebrew letters, but I don't speak Hebrew, except for some reason I know exactly what it means. What it means is Ezekiel 2, 1, our reading for today. And so I get out my King James Version of the Bible, the only one I had back then. And there it is. Stand up, O son of man, and I will speak to you. And to cut a long story short, two years later I was an ordained minister. I'd been through uh, a master's degree in theology. And I was traveling all over the world because I was running, I founded a global consulting business. And as part of that, I would always do ministry wherever I was. So I was called. Anyone here ever been called? I mean, that's a pretty dramatic call. Maybe the calls we get are more like, oh, I should really take care of my neighbor here who's suffering. Or maybe I should call my son or my daughter that I haven't talked to for 10 years. Something inside us calls us as Ezekiel's called. Does anyone know who else in the Bible was called with a vision? Numbers says, I am the Lord, and I will call you with a vision if I want you to prophesy. Who else? Saul. 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 Yeah, Samuel. Samuel is a good example. Uh, remember Eli's the old guy, and he says, Samuel, go to bed. Stop bothering me. Oh, I'm here. You kept calling me. No, it wasn't me. <laughs> And, and keeps on sending Samuel back to lay down and rest. And then the third time, it's very interesting, on the third occasion, Samuel gets up, hears a voice in, in, in his dreams, and gets up and goes to Eli and says, here I am. And Eli gets it. The Lord is calling you, Samuel. Jeremiah, in a, in a similar way, God's saying in a vision, I created you. Before you were born, I knew you, and I need you, I'm sending you out. To which the question is always, how do you respond to that? I mean, I, I find myself called to many things. Uh, for example, I'm in my office in Manhattan at 6th and 55th, and I'm sitting there just having a work day, ordinary day, and I get a call. I get a call from a guy called Dick Sauer, chief executive of 4-H National Council. And we know about 4-H, the seed clubs, how kids got, it's a billion dollar nonprofit these days, and it's, it's, it's how kids work with adults. And he wants me to run a board retreat for him. He says, you know, I've, I've heard about your work, but come and do a board retreat for me. 
So he tells me a bit about 4-H. I said, that's interesting. So before we do that, what's your, what's your mission? And he says, our mission is adults and children solving the problems of their communities. I said, terrific. How many children on your board? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Long silence. <laughs> Big pause. Cut a very long story short. We ran a workshop with 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds. It became the first nonprofit in this country to put children on the main board, not a children's advisory board, on the main board. There's some things legally you have to do in terms of a financial decision making about that, but basically children on board. And, and Kids on Board is now a, a, a website where you can see that these things happen. I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know to ask that question. Something inside me called me. I was called to do that. And not only was I called before some of these events, I was called at the events. And, and if you remember Lech Wałęsa and Solidarność, the trade union in Poland that stood up against the Russian authoritarians and, and the communists? Well, I get, I get a call. I'm again in my office in New York, and I get a call saying, uh, we'd like you to come and run a retreat in Warsaw. I, well, what's that all about? Well. Um, the government has a problem. They're fighting over this mass privatization program. The European banks have designed a program whereby worthless companies, companies that cannot produce steel at a competitive world rate, are going to be offered on the market. And, and everyone in the, in, the, in the country is going to get shares. Oh, great. They're going to get shares in something that's completely worthless. And guess how the banks are going to make out? Like bandits. So I say, look, I'm not, I know nothing about politics. I know nothing about Poland. Um, I, got, I got, yes, you can. Yes, you can. So I, I put down the phone, and I, I'll think about it. You know, and I wait a second time, and then the third time I get the call. I'll, OK, I'll go. So I'm flying over there on Aeroflot. Anybody ever flown an Aeroflot here? Very interesting. <laughs> as soon as I sit down in the chair, it, on the plane, it collapses. <laughs> and then the flight attendant says, oh, would you, oh yeah, uh, we know that's a problem. You shouldn't be sitting there. So uh, they're offering me orange juice. I'm thinking, well, actually, a vodka and orange would go down very nicely <laughs> right now. I'm feeling, <laughs> feeling, feeling kind of nervous. Anyway, I get to the airport, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, red carpet rolled up. Nobody's there. I don't know where I am. I'm in Warsaw. I don't speak Polish, and nobody's there to meet me. But I do have an address. And I think it's a hotel, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I give it to a taxi driver. They take me. I've got enough currency I've got at the airport to get there. It's where they used to house the communist generals. So you can imagine there's all kinds of eavesdropping devices all over the place and so on. And I go in. Fortunately, they do have vodka with every meal. So that was, <laughs> that was, that was very nice. Anyway. Somehow, a day or two later, I've met a translator, I've met Lekwawensa, I've talked to his people, and something comes into my head as I'm there. I'm saying, look, you want me to do a workshop with the opposing parties um, who are debating this mass privatization program to get them lined up on a better program for the people. Can I have one of your people there? And he introduces me to his chief economist, who, by the way, is a weightlifter. He said, I mean, he's built like this. And he was a weightlifter in the shipyard. And he's now chief economist of Poland. So he comes to the meeting. Thank God he comes to the meeting. Half an hour into the first day of the workshop, the government resigns on the mass privatization program. So the politicians stand up in the room and say, well, we're out of here. We don't need to do this workshop. <laughs> it's all over. Nothing's going to happen. And then this economist says, you know, the president, Lech, it's going to be very disappointed if you do that. Everyone sits down. Such was his influence there. And three days later, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was doing my classic, you know, it's, it's vision is like climbing a mountain. You choose the mountain you want to climb. You take steps. We put strategies in place. I'm just doing simple stuff. But three days later, we've redesigned the program, and I'm presenting to uh, Bielecki, the prime minister. And his government gets back in power. It's voted back in on the program. I don't know how to do that. 
it's said that the willingness to do brings the ability to do. And it's true. It's like, fake it till you make it. I have a dear friend who's a, a mentor. He, he wrote a book you may have heard of called What Colors Your Parachute About Careers. And he says, the great career is the intersection of your skills and your passion. And I say, put your passion first. People call me up all the time and, and say, I want to volunteer for a nonprofit. You know all about nonprofits. My first question is, what's your passion? Is it education? Is it children? Is it seniors? Is it homeless? What is your passion? Follow your passion. Make every day important. The money will come. The support will come. It's amazing. And I've been very rich with a big home in Malibu, ocean views, you know, Streisand's there. Um, somebody else whose name escapes me in my senior moment is elsewhere. And, uh, and I've been homeless. I've been on the streets of LA. Our lives are just this little fraction in time. And we really don't know when the end will come. When I used to live in London, there was a guy in Leicester Square that had a big sign, the end is nigh. He actually also said, and eat more vegetables. <laughs> so the end has been nigh for a long time. Christ said the end was nigh. There was a second coming. Paul says, any day now, the Lord's coming back. Well, those of us who've been to Jerusalem know the stone is, he never left. He went to inside of us in the spiritual world. We so focus on the material world, we forget the spiritual world. So, are you called? Are you called to something? Are you called to do something inside you? Do you quiet yourself enough so that you can hear the call? Because we get caught up in the everyday, you know? Me, yeah, me too. I mean, I may be standing up here with a, you know, funny colored stole and a dog collar, but that, you know, that's, I'm us. We're us. We're all doing this together. Your relationship with God is directly with God. It's not through me. Are you called? And if you're called, how do you know which voice it is? Whose voice it is? I test the voice. I use that HU charm against it, and I notice anything that's not for me gets moved away. And then I find out God, I mean, it's pretty obvious to me, you know, if somebody says Ezekiel 2.1 uh, in my meditation, uh, uh, that's not Lucifer. <laughs> He's not going to say Ezekiel 2.1. We are called. But we need to listen for the call. And then the question comes, what is our response to the call? How did Isaiah respond to his call? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are the great provider, the giver of all gifts. Your love, the only true currency. Thank you for putting money into our hands. We freely offer it back to you for use in your service. We do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pray the Lord's Prayer, whatever form you want, whatever works for you, in, in your own words. Mother, Father, God. Great Spirit, our Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.